Hey guys, this is AC Service Tech, and today what we're looking at is TXVs versus pistons. Okay, so you're going to have usually one or the other, unless you have a capillary tube, which will be a tube maybe about the size of this, or in most cases, you're going to have a piston slash orifice, whatever you'd like to call it, or a TXV. All right, we're going to go over some of the reasons uh, why the manufacturers have switched over to this. We're kind of going over some safety and efficiency. So we're talking about comfort cooling. We're talking about cooling mode right in front of the evaporator coil, which is at the indoor coil. I just want to go over some things with you. A thermostatic expansion valve, they're not that expensive. They're anywhere, say, $60 to $100. You know, usually they're about 80 bucks or so. Right on the top, uh, it's going to say, or on the side here, it'll say what it's good for. If it's good for R22 or R410A, or maybe it's a different refrigerant, you know, some will say, R12 and 134A because the two are semi close in pressure. All right, but uh, if you have an R410 ATXV in a R22 system, it won't work well. Well, won't work at all. Pressures and temperatures are too far apart. It, it will not work. Most manufacturers have stopped supplying the piston with the outdoor unit. And that and I say most. Okay, so here we have a piston chamber. Okay, instead of a TXV. So inside, you're going to have your piston or orifice, whatever you'd like to call it. Right there, you have your nut, which you can take off. And you have your seal right there. Inside, you're going to have your piston. And that will be sized according to the size of the outdoor unit. All right, so that is what the older ones look like. Here's some of the newer ones. You can see that there's a little seal on the side right there. So this would be if you were uh, in air conditioning mode, this would seal against the front. And then if you were in heat pump mode, it would move back and it would flow the refrigerant around the piston. So let's get into it. This TXV right here controls the superheat. And what I mean by the superheat is you have high pressure, high temperature, liquid refrigerant coming in. It hits this metering device. It then only allows a small amount of refrigerant through. So then it reduces the pressure because your high pressure here, it reduces the pressure and temperature follows. It comes into here as a low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant. And it's about 80% liquid, 20% flash gas. It comes up to here and then you have a saturated state where liquid and vapor both exist. The saturated state is where you're able to absorb most of the moisture in the house. And then you have your superheat up here. All right, you see that these distributor tubes are heading down towards the bottom, and then it works its way up through the saturated state. Once it gets out of the saturated state, the superheat is the temperature increase in vapor form until it comes out here. And that's why this bulb's here, and that's why this external equalization port's here. It's allowing the TXV, the mechanical TXV, uh, to be able to monitor the temperature rise, okay? So what you have is this TXV is normally going to keep that superheat at about 14 degrees of superheat. 14 degree temperature rise between here and here. Okay, so if it does that, it doesn't matter if it's the first time that you started up the air conditioner. All right, so you install an air conditioner for the first time. The house is hot inside. Maybe it's 85 degrees, ridiculous humidity. What's going to happen when you turn this thing on, uh, when you turn the whole air conditioning system on, this metering device is going to sense, whoa, it's this high superheat, and it's going to allow more liquid refrigerant through. So you're going to have more of a cooling effect. Okay, If the temperature is very, very hot across this coil and has high humidity, then this coil is going to battle the heat. It's not going to be able to absorb that much heat if it only has a steady amount coming through, like in the instance of a, of a piston. A piston is a fixed orifice, and it's only going to allow the exact amount of refrigerant through. So depending on the wet bulb temperature inside, the humidity, you know, the humidity inside, and the outdoor temperature, because if the outdoor temperature is high, then this temperature is going to be high in a liquid line. So depending on those factors, it's, it's, it's still going to only allow so much through, through this piston. It's fixed, okay? So the superheat that's in the quill might be really, really large amount of superheat on a hot, humid day, especially when you just turn on the air conditioner for the first time and 
on a colder day, it's going to be going to be less superheat. All right, so but this, the thermostatic expansion valve, is able to open up and really allow a lot of liquid refrigerant through. You're still going to have your pressure decrease, which then temperature is going to follow, and you're still going to have a great cooling effect. It's just it widens up the saturated state where it's able to pack in all of the heat energy. Okay, so that. TXV is actually a lot more efficient. All right, so it's able to cool the house down faster upon initial startup. Uh, I remember one time when I was installing a piston, this was back in my beginning days, and I checked for my target superheat. I found my target superheat. I put the refrigerant charge at the correct superheat, and then I went inside and I started doubting myself because I took a temperature reading between the return air and the supply air inside the house. And I found only 13, actually about 14 degrees and I said, that's not right. You know, I should have 18 to 21 degrees. And uh, I called a, another service tech within the company, and they said, you know, you, you can't stand there and wait for the temperature to get to 18 to 21 degree temperature difference. And the first question out of his mouth was, did you set the superheat correctly? I said, yeah. And he said, well, then it's fine. You're just battling the high humidity and the high heat inside the house. Once that goes down, once it runs for an hour or two, you will have 18 to 21 degree temp difference. But around here, so at the at the shore where I'm at, we have it's a high tourist uh, area. So you have people trying to save money, turning the air conditioner off, and then you have the tourists come down, rent the house, and they want that air conditioner to work immediately. And what happens around here is it might take three, four hours for the temperature to to really, really fall to a comfortable level in that house and they doubt if it's working. Then the service tech gets a phone call, the homeowner gets a bill, uh, but everything was fine in the beginning. It's just there was a, a piston installed at that building. Okay, a thermostatic expansion valve is more capable of handling a higher load. Okay, so um, it's actually more efficient. Uh, it can monitor the superheat and always adjust depending on the load. All right, second factor. The second factor, uh, deciding factor, say for an installer to install a piston or an orifice, is nowadays the, the supplier doesn't really give you the piston a lot of times anymore. Uh, most manufacturers don't, so you have to go and try to buy them separately. So you might as well go ahead and buy the, the TXV, but the, the real second point of it, of it is that I was trying to get at is, what if the homeowner doesn't change the filter, okay? Uh, what if the blower motor breaks? So that's what I want you to think about here. What happens is this is a fixed orifice, so it always allows the same amount of refrigerant through to the distributor tubes and, and therefore the evaporator coil. So it doesn't, it doesn't know if the blower motor is broken or that the filter is completely clogged. Whereas the thermostatic expansion valve says, wait a second, the temperature is way too cold over here. We're not getting any superheat. That's not good. And what it does is it starts to lessen the amount of refrigerant flow into this. Okay, if you don't have superheat up here, that's a problem for your compressor. Unless you have an accumulator installed at your outdoor, uh, right in front of your outdoor compressor, that's going to be an issue if you just have a piston and it's just allowing liquid refrigerant through. We know, you know, you, the coil is going to freeze because it has no heat to absorb from the house. So the refrigerant doesn't warm up. It just stays cold because the low pressure in here doesn't have a chance to rise to a higher pressure and a higher temperature okay because it's absorbing heat it doesn't get a chance to do that so what happens is no superheat and you have still coming out of this line and going back to the compressor liquid and vapor refrigerant going back to the compressor that's a vapor compressor it's not good to have any liquid in it and it's just getting a lot of liquid now okay so the whole time that's freezing, the whole time that thing's running, you're getting liquid refrigerant into the compressor if you have a, a piston. You're still going to get it uh, with a TXV because it, obviously it's not absorbing any heat. And this TXV will not close down completely all the way. Actually, it closes down this way. Um, but it won't close down all the way. Okay, it's still going to always let, allow some through. But this has no way of reducing the effect or reducing, say, that damage that, that would have occurred on that compressor. Okay, so that's... That's number two. All right, number three. If you need to install a system and you, you don't have the correct size piston, the TXV, you can buy a TXV that could handle a ton and a half to three tons. So 
instead of having a ton and a half piston, a two ton piston, a two and a half ton piston, and a three ton piston, in your service truck you can have a thermostatic expansion valve, which, you know, if you had to do any type of um, um, checks on the system and see if maybe you have a strainer that's clogged or, or something like that, uh, you know, you can check your piston chamber. Uh, you can actually step up in a higher efficiency uh, with installing a thermostatic expansion valve. All right, so so you can just have one in the truck for a range of ton and a half to three ton. Then maybe one from three ton to four ton, and maybe one from four ton to five ton. Okay, uh, you can also use adjustable TXVs. Most of the time in comfort cooling, you can get them. Uh, they're just a fixed uh, amount. Okay, it's a fixed range. And it doesn't matter if you install this, uh, say, ton and a half TXV on a ton and a half or a three ton, it's still going to be roughly the same amount of efficiency. It's just the amount of operating range because it's still going to always monitor the superheat. All right, so that's the key right there. Okay. The fourth reason uh, is, and I know I'm throwing extra little reasons in there in between these other ones, but the fourth reason is the TXV is actually easier to check the refrigerant charge uh, of a system. So you just check in subcooling. You want to put your temperature probe on the liquid line right by the service valve of the outdoor unit. And then you're just checking your pressure converted to temperature. So say we are at, say, 250 right here. Our Fortune is the pink inner ring, if you can see that. So to check the subcooling, we just check our high side gauge and we see it's at about 250 PSIG. If this is R410A on the pink inner ring, the pink inner ring is saturated temperature and you see that it's 83 degrees in the middle of the condenser coil. Then you just need a temp probe right on the liquid line right next to the service valve. Okay. What you do is you take that 83 degrees right here, which is the saturated temperature in the middle of the condenser coil, minus this temperature right here and say this was 73 degrees that's 10 degrees of subcooling. To check superheat, you'd need to do a few other steps. So you'd need to check your wet bulb temperature at the largest return that's closest to the unit, or you can do an induct sensor for your psychrometer. Okay, so you're going to get, need your wet bulb temperature for checking the refrigerant charge using a piston. Then you have to find your outdoor temperature outside, and then you have to calculate them in order to find your target superheat needed. Now you could end up getting something like that field piece SDP2 uh, and that would help you along the way so you don't have to keep running in the house to uh, check the wet bulb. You still have to figure out your superheat, calculate your superheat, charge uh, your superheat and then you know it's very critical to check a refrigerant charge and adjust it for a piston. They say about three degrees plus or minus but the reality is with the with a piston you really want to be closer than that you want to be maybe one to two degrees uh, away from your target superheat the thermostatic expansion valve you can have a wider gap you know it, it can be three degrees plus or minus and i've told you before in some of the other videos if a if an outdoor unit is calling for say 12 degrees of, of subcooling i end up putting roughly about 14 degrees of subcooling in uh, because it's still within the range and it leaves just a little bit extra refrigerant in uh, for uh, future technicians attaching and detaching their gauge sets and taking just a little bit of refrigerant out of that system. Uh, so I'd rather be on that side than say if the system's calling for 12 degrees of subcooling on the outdoor rating plate of the outdoor unit. I would rather have 14 degrees of subcooling rather than 9 degrees of subcooling. At 9 degrees of subcooling the unit will work fine and you'll have a steady stream of liquid going to the metering device. It's just if you have a couple technicians attaching, reattaching, you know, uh, they're going to think, oh, maybe we're a little low on refrigerant. We're going to have to add some refrigerant. OK, so uh, it's not as as critical with a thermostatic expansion valve because it will monitor the superheat. OK, so piston, very, very uh, particular uh, with your with your charge it has to be dead on. And if it's not dead on and you had maybe a technician just looking at the pressures on the a gauge set, you know, in order to charge instead of actually checking superheat. On colder days, you really actually may have no superheat in that evaporator coil because they, on colder days, you, the actual superheat the thing's supposed to have is maybe only six degrees of superheat. And on, in that instance, you may be set to basically have no superheat uh, because maybe somebody just checked the charge with just checking the pressure. 
But anyway, so uh, so that's it. I, I really think, you know, checking the refrigerant charge with a thermostatic expansion valve is a little bit easier, okay? It's higher efficiency. Um, it always checks the superheat. It's safer uh, in case your filter gets clogged or maybe the underside of this coil ends up having dust on it. Maybe the blower motor breaks, you know, all those things. It, it's, it's better for the system uh, in, in that instance. And they don't go bad that often, all right? They, they get blamed a lot, but they really don't go bad that, that often. Do they go bad? Yes, they could, they could end up leaking refrigerant uh, from, from this right here. This right here is like a little mini refrigerant bottle. This is your thermostatic expansion bowl. Uh, sometimes when the installer is putting this in, they, they bend this top right here, it cracks and some refrigerant comes out. If this does not have any refrigerant, it cannot apply pressure on the head. The refrigerant in these tubes right here is different from the refrigerant that is running through the system. Okay, the refrigerant that's in this bulb came with the thermostatic expansion valve, and that's why uh, you can only use an R22 thermostatic expansion valve with an R22 system, or likewise a R410A uh, system uh, can only use an R410A uh, thermostatic expansion valve. All right, so so there's some of my thoughts on that. Um, hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.